And this guy runs up and I'm literally standing right beside this Mexican guy. He's right here. His head is right here. Runs up behind him with a lock and goes thump and just hits him in the head. I've never seen blood like this. I mean, they always tend to hit each other in the head because your head bleeds a lot. Hey, this is Matt Cox, and I'm going to be going over the first day in federal prison. So uh, my first day in federal prison after, you know, after I went through processing and, you know, they fingerprint you and take your photo and you answer some questions. Then they send you, well, they, then they sent me to, uh, it was basically like a, a, a hub unit where you, you kind of get categorized and I, uh, I went to this unit. I want to say it was A2. So in the federal prison I went to, I went to obviously the complex, and I've, I think I've already explained that in a different video. But I was in the medium, and there's three large buildings in the medium. And they're, gosh, they're like four stories high. And so the first place I was placed, so you would have like A building, B building, C building. Well, in A building, there's, you know, unit you know a1 a2 a3 and a4 so i think i went to a2 so i go to a2 and as soon as i go in there you they give you a card like a bed card or a cell card and you go in there and you give the officer your card so i walk in i give him my card and i say hey i, I need to be assigned to i just got here need to be assigned a um cell and he he assigns me a cell I go straight in and I, there was a Mexican guy that was in there. Uh, and he, you know, real nice guy introduced myself, introduced himself and was like, okay, Hey, you know, you get the, you get, cause he had been there longer. So he had the bottom bunk. It was a two man cell. He said, you know, you're in the, you're in the, uh, top, uh, you're on the top bunk. So I go on the top bunk I put my bedroll, you know, you have to go there. You have like a, a bedroll and, and it's it's a pillow, which is horrible. You get like a pillow, a couple of sheets, uh, a, I think I think you get two blankets and like two sheets and, and then a, a pillow case and, and a really crappy pillow. Or they don't give you a pillow at all because they just don't have any. So you get a crappy pillow. So I go in there. Uh, I, I walk in. I get introduced to this guy. Really nice guy. He was from Texas. Um, I think they called him a Texacana or something like that. They've got like a name for him. And he's, uh, you know, he's part of like uh, the, I think they're called Cervenos, uh, which is a, a gang. It's kind of like a loose affiliated gang of different types of of Mexicans. And they also, all the Mexicans kind of click up. And so in prison, most prisons, you know, all the blacks will kind of click up and they'll have what they call different cars but they all basically kind of click up together. The blacks click up, the whites click up, the Hispanics clip up, uh, click up, click up, and and then they have what's, what's called different cars. And so you may be a black guy, and you'll but you'll be in let's say the Georgia car. Why? Because you're from Georgia. So you know you want to be around your homeboys, and so you have something in common. So I go in the cell. the the uh, The Mexican guy is really cool. Um. You know, he's clicked up with the uh, with uh, kind of the, that prison game, the Cervenos. And he asked me like, hey, are, you know, do you know, do you have anybody here? I said, I don't know. I got a, I got a cousin that's in prison here somewhere. And he goes, OK, OK, what's his name? And I told him his name. He said, OK, well, I'll try and help you find him. He goes, there's not a lot of white guys here. He said, it should be easy to find him. I said, OK. And he said, you need to, um, you know, he said, uh, uh. Go check the call out sheet, see if he's on the call out sheet, because there's a sheet every day of of people that come out on the call out sheet and they have to go to different you have different things scheduled. So one day I may be on the call out sheet to go see my counselor at two o'clock, or I may be on the call out sheet to see um, you know, medical or whatever. So I checked the call out sheet and he explained to me that every day you have to check the call out sheet to see if you have any appointments. So I go and I check the call out sheet and I don't have any appointments, but I know within the next few days, I will have appointments with like my counselor, with medical, with um, education will want to see you. There's a whole bunch of things you're going to have to do. Hey, I wanted to let you guys know that I have a Patreon account. If you're interested in joining the Patreon account, it's got three tiers. The top tier, you actually get a different 
con man painting every single month. If you're already joined and you're already supporting me, I really appreciate that. If you haven't joined yet and you're interested in joining, I'm going to leave the contact information for Patreon in the description. Thank you very much for watching the video. Back to the video. While I was looking at the call out sheet, I remember suddenly like they start, there's like a, a you know, the PA system suddenly they start screaming out, lockdown, lockdown, lockdown. And everybody just immediately starts moving. Like there's like a hundred, 150 guys in this one unit, maybe one between, I think probably one between 120 and 150. So guys are, are rushing all over the place and they're, you know, they're running uh, back and forth. And what they're running around to do is to get things like heat up a soup, so that they know that they might be locked down for the next couple of hours. And so they want to be able to put a soup in the microwave. And each unit had two or three microwaves. Uh, or maybe they're just going to get hot water because maybe you didn't get hot water in the in the sinks in, in the actual room. Whatever the thing they did was they would run around to other guys, other cells and ask for, for stuff. Or they would go to, right away they'd go to, let's say, the, the store man. Because in every unit... There's at least one or two guys that run what's called a store. So some guy will have, he keeps like 20 or 30 soups. He'll keep 20 or 30 soups. He'll have like seven or eight different candy bars. Uh, he'll have, you know, like five Snickers, five, um, you know, Kit Kats, five, whatever. He'll have bags of potato chips. He'll have extra sodas. And he keeps all that stuff in his locker. And so you can go to that guy and say, hey, man, can I get a, a soda? And he'll sell you a soda for, let's say, two stamps. Well, soda costs him, you know, 50 cents. He'll sell it to you for two or three stamps. Well, a stamp's worth about, at that point, about 50 cents. So you give him two stamps or you give him three stamps and he would give you a soda. Or he would write, a, he would write down a list of things that you owed him. And then he would add it up for how much money you owed him. And then when it's your turn to go to commissary, and I can, you know, I think everybody knows what commissary is. It's basically the where you buy stuff on the compound. And you go there once a week. So he would give you a list of things to buy him that's equivalent to what you owed him. And that's how he kept his store restocked. And he basically had about a 50% markup on anything that he bought. So it's a good little gig for him, for the store man. Um, of course, sometimes people run up a debt. They don't pay or they get shipped or moved. But either way, if you're making a 50% markup or sometimes double, some of these guys are charging like double. Uh, it depends on you know what the item is. So guys are running the store man. They're screaming, lockdown, lockdown. I don't really know what lockdown is in the, in the Marshall's holdover. When they call, told us to go to our rooms, they would just announce, go to your rooms. So I, everybody's screaming, everybody's running around. The PA system is going off. The CO's yelling at guys to hurry up and get in their room. The CO basically, as soon as they scream lockdown, he walks to the very first cell and locks the door. And if you're not in your cell, you get what's called a disciplinary shot. You, they call it, they write you a shot and you get a disciplinary, you know, um, uh, whatever um, shot on your record or whatever you want to call it. I don't know. Uh, I don't know what, what it stands for. But the point is, is that he, he immediately walks to the first cell. So if you're in the first cell, you basically never have any time at all. Now, great, granted, you get out before everybody else, but you never have any time to do anything. So he walks to the first cell and guys are screaming, wait, wait. And they're running to get in their cells. And, and so, but if you're the guy in the last cell, you've got 15 minutes to heat stuff up. So guys are running around getting stuff. And I, and all of a sudden I'm just sitting there. I don't know what's happening. I just noticed this, the guards were running around locking doors. They're screaming. I'm starting to think, Hey, I think I'm supposed to go to my cell. My old, my new cell, he comes walking over to me and he says, he says, Hey man, Cox, Cox, he says, you got to go in the cell, man. You got to go in the cell. Come on. We got to go in the cell. And I went, okay, bro. And I turned around. I said, Oh, why? What's going on? What's going on? He said, he said, yeah, man, uh, uh, not a big, it's not a big deal, man. We're just getting locked down. He said, somebody got stabbed in the yard. And I went, and I remember thinking, oh, my God, someone just got killed. Like they just, somebody just got murdered in the yard. Because to me, getting stabbed meant they killed you. It's like, to me, if they say, yeah, man, they shot him. I think you died. I didn't realize that apparently people get shot and stabbed all the time. They just don't die. So 
he said, uh, he goes, nah, man, they just stabbed this guy up in the yard. And I went, bro, I said, oh my God, goes, somebody just got killed in the yard. He goes, nah, bro, they just stabbed him up a little bit. And he kind of did his hand like this, like, like, cha, 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 like, you, like a bunch of little stabs. Nah, they just stabbed him up a little bit. He goes, he, goes, he ain't going to die or nothing. He said, they just stabbed him up, you know, teach him a lesson. And I thought, man, that's where you're at, bro. You're at a place where to teach you a lesson, the inmates stab each other. Now, I went in and I just remember thinking, oh, my God, like, that's rough. Like, you're in a fucking rough spot. So I go, I end up going into the cell. And I remember thinking, they just stabbed somebody. We're going to be locked in for a long time, days maybe. Literally by the, that was whatever time it was. I don't know, one or two o'clock. By... Four o'clock, they unlock the doors and they serve chow. Everybody stands by the door. The units get called in in a different order because they have an inspection every week to determine which units get called first. If you have the best, cleanest unit, then that unit gets called first. And so there's first, second, third, fourth, fifth, you know, all the way. They have 12 units total. Three buildings, 12 units. So the guy says... uh you know, um, they announce chow, they open the doors, we walk out, we stand by the front door. And then a few minutes later, they open the door and we go straight to the chow hall. Like, I don't know anything. I'm just following people at this point. Like, nobody's told me anything. So I, I walk straight to, you know, my celly barely speaks English. So I walk straight to the chow hall. I stand in line. I go in. They give me, uh, they give us food. The food was Really not bad. Now, here's the thing. They have, at this point, every facility cook their own food. They had a list of what they were going to serve week to week. But they didn't um, They didn't have what – they ultimately moved to what's called a national menu where every place is served the same meal throughout the country. So at this point, each – each prison was in charge of making their own meals. So they gave them a budget. They spend that money. Coleman had good food. They had, when I went in the chow hall, I remember being shocked because they had, uh, they had Coca-Cola products. Like you could literally go get a fountain drink. You could walk up and get a Sprite or a Coca-Cola or a Diet Coke or whatever. Like they had all these fountain drinks. The food was good. It was like fried chicken or something. I was like, oh my God, like I, I'm a, this is all right. Like this is not bad at all. I'd been living in, I'd been uh, in Atlanta City Detention Center, which was the U.S. Marshals holdover, and it, the food was horrible. So, you know, I got there and I was like, wow, this is like they're feeding us way better than we deserve. Um, and so I got some food, sat down, you know, I ate. I remember I walked up to a, a table. And there was a, there were a couple black guys that were there. And I go, do you guys mind if I sit? And the guy was, they looked up and they went, nah, man, they ain't no, there's no assigned seating here, seating here. You can sit wherever you want, bro. I sat down. I ate. I came back. Uh, came back to the unit. Um, I heard from my celly later that the guy that got sat, uh, got stabbed, it was over something ridiculous, like a small debt that he owed or People get stabbed, would get stabbed over all kinds of things. They would get stabbed over, listen, I have I saw a guy get hit with a lock with a, like stabbing, it's funny because stabbings are not nearly as bad as, well, as bloody as being hit with like a lock. I saw a guy, probably within a few weeks of that, I actually saw a guy get hit with a lock and that somebody uh, was there were two like Mexicans and one uh, Mexican guy had a lock on a belt and he had it tied around his his hand and then they they leave it just about that much right so about four or five inches to the lock and what happens is he I was standing in line in the rec center waiting the rec yard whatever you call it and I was about to waiting for the gate to open I'm just standing they have two different gates so I was at the second gate. Or at the first gate. So I'm at the first gate and I'm waiting to go into this the bull, this bullpen area to go to the second uh, – have the second gate open, which actually lets you out of the out of the yard. 
So I'm waiting there for them to call the what they call a move. I'll explain that in a second. And this guy runs up and I'm literally standing right beside this Mexican guy. He's right here. His head is right here. And I'm just standing because you're all kind of crowded. So I'm standing there waiting and another Mexican guy runs up behind him with a lock and goes thump and just hits him in the head. Thump, thump. This was just as the door had opened. So the guy kind of stumbles forward through the door, through the gate, and he and he stumbles, hits the ground, goes to stand up, holding his hand, his head. Thump, the guy hits him again. Thump, hits him again. He falls down, waits a minute. Guy goes to get up again. Thump, he must have hit him six times. All in the head. This guy was bleeding like I've never seen blood like this. I mean, this was this was like just gushing blood. I didn't realize it, but uh, at, till, at, you know, later when I talked to some people about it, they were like, oh, yeah, you're, they always tend to hit each other in the head because your head bleeds a lot. And this guy bled so much that he had a white shirt on that when he was done looked like a dark, like burgundy, just just completely drenched, like tie dyed. But I mean, there was 80 percent of it was covered down his back, his front. I mean, he's holding his head. He's been over. That guy, as bad as he was bleeding, actually tried to get out of the rec yard to go back to the unit. Didn't want to tell anybody. Didn't want to go to medical because he knew if he went to medical, they're going to stitch him up. They're going to put him in the shoe and they're going to ship him. Even if he told on the other guy that hit him, he knew that he was still going to end up getting shipped. And then the other guy gets shipped and then he goes somewhere else and he's a, and they would be tell, saying, oh, he's a snitch because I because he told on the guy that hit him with a lock. Well, I found out later that that guy actually got hit with the lock specifically because the one Mexican, the one in front of me was messing with the other Mexicans punk. A punk in prison is like your boyfriend. So you have like a male dominated, uh, a male and female kind of a you know, homosexual relationship and the female, the one person that plays the punk or the woman is called a punk. So he, the one guy was messing with the other guy's punk. He told him several times, don't fuck with my punk anymore. He didn't, he wouldn't heed the other guy's warning. And so eventually he got a, a, a lock and a belt and ran up behind him and thump, 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 thump. I don't know whatever happened. Yeah, I know. Yeah. It was like a rough high school. You're playing, you're, don't mess with my, my girlfriend and, oh, fuck you. I'll do what I want to do. And the guy keeps messing with him. The girlfriend keeps saying he's messing with me. He's bothering me. And then what happened? They get into a fist fight. Only they didn't get into a fist fight. They took a lock and smashed the other dude. Hey, if you guys didn't know, I also do, I do paintings. And uh, if you're interested in a painting, I'm going to leave my contact information in the description beneath the video. Back to the video. So, the, the thing about being in that prison, one of the things, other than when my cousin showed up and I met my cousin, which is hilarious. This guy was nuts. So that, you know, the prison was what it, in all, in most prisons, except for, except for camps, you have what's called controlled movements. And so what happens is at the, at the beginning of each hour. So let's say at, at let's say at a quarter till or more like 10 till one, they call a move. They unlock all the doors in the prison and they say, you know, uh, uh, one o'clock move, one o'clock move. And so you have from 1250 to, to one o'clock to leave the unit or leave wherever you are located and get to another place in the prison. So if you're on the rec yard and they call the one o'clock move, which is about 10 till one, they open the they open the compound for 10 minutes and you have to race across the compound because the buildings are really spread up, spread out. You have to kind of kind of walk fast like a like a like an old soccer, like a soccer mom or something. You know, you do like the fast walking across the compound to try and get to, let's say, the library because you might have an appointment at the library or maybe you have to get to medical because you have a medical appointment. Or you have to meet your counselor or you have to go to school. Maybe you're trying to get your GED. I don't know. Or you go to Vo Votech, we have a vocational um, – it's a vocational school that they have there. And, or maybe you have to go to work. You know, They have a, a unicorn there. With unicorn is where you it's – a, it's a factory in the prison that hires the prisoners to work there and make things. I want to say they made – um, they made the partition walls for like cubicles in offices. So Unicor made those walls. Um, 
Uh, what else? Uh, yeah, so you might you got to get to work, and they'd call 1 o'clock move, 2 o'clock move, 3 o'clock move, and then a 4 o'clock move. You'd have to go back to the unit. And then they count you, like they, they would count all of us at, I want to say, they count you throughout the night, but they count you at like 10 o'clock in the morning after you wake up at like, they call it, count you at like 6, they count you at like 10, they count at, again, at 12, and then at 4 o'clock, and then again at 10 o'clock. So anyway, uh, I would say by the second or third day, I'd had a couple of white guys approach me and they wanted to see my paperwork. And I actually had my pre-sentence report. I actually had the report that was done on me by, uh, by the, uh, the probation officer in my case, uh, which works for the U S attorney's office. So the U S attorney and the probation officer actually prepared a document I think I talked about a PSI too. It's like a recommend. It's a recommendation. It basically, it goes over all your charges and where you fall on the federal sentencing guideline. So what happens is in that document, if you cooperated, it typically says you cooperated and you got a sentence reduction. But I didn't get a sentence reduction. So, but I did cooperate, but I didn't get any benefit from it. So guys are sent. White guys are coming up to me, going, "Yo, bro, you know, like, you know, you're gonna have in the next week or two, you're gonna have to figure out how to show your PSI." Or your pre, P, some people call it a PSI, some people call it a PSR. Your pre-sentence report, it's pre-sentence investigation report. So we need to see your PSI. And I was like, yeah, okay, okay. And I, within probably a few days, my lawyer actually mailed it in. And I remember I got it, and this one white guy in the unit said, um, we were talking, and he said, yeah, bro, he said, you know, these guys are asking about your PS, PSI. And I was like, Okay. I said, well, I've got it. I said, I got it in. And he goes, oh, can I see it? I said, sure. So I open it up and he looks through it. And as he's looking through it, he goes, yeah, bro, it looks like you, uh, damn, man, they really busted you in the head, didn't they? They they got 26 years, man. That's crazy. I said, I know. And he looked it over and he said, yeah, bro, it says you're good. I said, well, what do you understand what you're looking for? And he goes, oh, to see if you cooperated. And he said, you know, like, like uh, if you fucking snitched on anybody. And I go, why would it say in my PSI? He goes, well, usually because it'll tell you got a reduction. And I said, no, I didn't get a reduction. He said, yeah, I know. He said, a few people had asked me, did you, hey, man, what's up? Did you get a sentence reduction? I was like, no, because I didn't. And I remember the guy was like, yeah, bro, it looks good. It looks good. And I said, you want to know if I cooperated? And he goes, yeah. And I said, yeah, bro. I said, I fucking cooperated on everybody. I said, it just didn't do, it just didn't, it just didn't get anything for it. And he looked at me and he was like, Yo, man, I, I wouldn't tell anybody. <laughs> I wouldn't tell anybody that. And I went, why? And he said, yeah, man, these guys are going to have a problem with that. I said, okay. I said, and and what? He said, well, you know, you're going to need people to back you up. And I was like, back me up for what? You know, like, you know, if you get into any shit, I go, what kind of shit would I get into? Like, what what's going to happen to me? What am I going to do? Like, I'm not, it, I, I wasn't aware. I had been in a in a U.S. Marshal's holdover, which was tame. And it sucked because it was boring, but it was tame because there was no real gang politics. So I didn't really know what I was getting into. Anyway, he, the guy, so the guy that I talked to basically immediately went around telling everybody that I cooperated. For guys that, for guys that go to prison and want to only be around guys that mind their own business and don't talk shit and don't cooperate with the authorities and don't run their mouth and are respectful. These guys talk like a bunch of old women. They're always talking about each other. That's why they get in trouble. They talk shit about each other. They say stuff behind each other's back and then they get in trouble. And they get beat up and they get hit with hit with locks or stabbed up. Um. So anyway, yeah, that's uh uh. So right away. The white guys at Coleman Medium immediately don't like me. Like immediately they dislike me. And uh, yeah, anyway. So yeah, I, I had it. There was a, there was, there were some real, there were some issues there. And I will let you know what those issues are on the next video. And I appreciate you guys watching. So next video, I'm going to tell you what happened. And I meet my cousin in prison. His, in prison, his name was Reese Townsend, and he was awesome. And I will uh, I'll let you know all about it in the next video. So 
Check it out. Do me a favor and subscribe if you like the video. If you want to get notified for videos like this, hit the bell and leave a comment in the comment section and uh, stay tuned. See ya.